Our scripture reading this morning comes from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 11. Hear these words. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children, because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were looking for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for God has prepared a city for them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Again, we say welcome to all who are joining in worship this morning, those as well joining on television and online. Say a special word of welcome to those joining us in Cave City, Damascus, and Russellville, as well as those joining with us from hospitals and nursing homes. We are glad you are here. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Be in my speaking, be in our hearing, and be in our living. Amen. Last month, my husband and I made an offer on a house I had never stepped foot into. Now, to be fair, I had seen it via FaceTime as he walked me through the house, iPhone in hand, showing me room by room by room. After just a few minutes, as I sat far away in our Chicago apartment, he said to me, if you like it, we're going to put an offer in on it tonight. You trust me, right? This will be a great home for us. I think you're really going to like it. And so, pretty close to sight unseen, I said yes to buying this house. If you've joined us for worship the last couple of weeks, you've perhaps noticed a bit of a theme developing in the scripture readings from which our sermons have come. Two weeks ago, we heard in the Gospel of Luke, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock, and the door will be opened to you. And last Sunday, Reverend Kathleen encouraged us from the letter to the Colossians that we can live as new selves, renewed in Christ, because your old self died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. This week in the letter to the Hebrews, we hear these words, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Hebrews is a book of the Bible full of easy to quote one-liners, and this is one of the better known. I love the way that the recently released NRSV updated edition translates that particular verse. Faith is the reality of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, how can something we've only hoped for be real? How, you might ask, could we possibly provide evidence of something that cannot be seen? For the same reason, we can know that when we ask, seek, and knock, that God will hear our needs and respond in love. 
For the same reason, we can have confidence in our ability to actually live lives free from immorality, greed, anger, and malice. Because God, made fully known to us in Jesus, is trustworthy. We can trust, these verses all tell us, that when God makes a promise, God will keep it. When God says God will do something, it'll happen, even and perhaps especially when it seems impossible. The writer of Hebrews tells us that the word of God alone, the breath of God that spoke, let there be light, has the power to create possibility out of impossibility. It makes no logical sense that the universe was formed out of seeming nothingness simply because God said it was so, unless we have faith, the text tells us. And by faith, we understand, even if sometimes it still doesn't make sense, because we know that we can trust in God. C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite authors, presented a paper to the Oxford Socratic Club in 1944 entitled, Is Theology Poetry? In his paper, he makes this beautiful closing statement. I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. Sometimes trusting God makes no logical sense until we have faith. And then in the light of that faith, everything makes sense. It was that kind of faith, the writer of Hebrews tells us, this sight unseen faith that the ancients had and were commended for. The verses that we skipped in our reading for today give us the names and the short stories of a few of those great ancients who were faithful and trusted in God, Abel, Enoch, and Noah. And then the writer focuses our attention on one of the greatest, Abraham. By faith, the writer emphasizes, Abraham got up and went, sight unseen when God called even though he did not know where he was going. I imagine God having a similar conversation with Abraham to the one I had with my husband. You trust me, right? This will be a great home for you, for your family, for generations to come. I think you're really going to like it. When Abraham got there, there wasn't even a house for him to move into. By faith, the writer emphasizes again, he lived in a tent, still living like a stranger in a foreign country as he made his home in the land God had promised to him. And by faith, the writer emphasizes once more, even Sarah, Abraham's wife, Sarah who laughed when first presented with the ludicrous impossibility of having a child at her old age, was able to bear children because, and this phrase is so beautiful, she considered him faithful who had made the promise. Sarah didn't trust because it made sense. She trusted because she knew God is faithful. Sarah even names her child laughter, Isaac, as a reminder of God's radical trustworthiness to make good on God's promises, even the laughably improbable ones. I love that the writer includes Sarah here among these faithful ancients for two reasons. The first is because she is a woman, and any time a woman gets a shout out in the Bible, a book written mostly by and about men, that is worth celebrating. But also because it is comforting to know that when I doubt or smirk or laugh when God calls me to do something by faith, to trust God's nudgings even when I can't see where they might lead. God doesn't judge or condemn or say, well, then never mind, I won't give it to you. God just keeps being God because the one who made the promise is faithful. 
In Hebrews chapter 12, the chapter after our passage for today, the ancients are referred to by another name in perhaps the best known verse from this book of the Bible. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Just a couple of weeks ago, on July 21st, Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church had a birthday. Did you know that? We turned 110. We are now even older as a church than the 99 years young that Abraham was when God called him and his family to step out in faith and venture into the unknown. And God is still calling us to bigger, bolder, and braver things. Celebrating our church's birthday and walking through the halls of our buildings this week got me thinking about our own great cloud of witnesses some who are no longer with us, but many of whom are still living and walking faithfully with Christ. Their names are on our buildings and their ministries have transformed our lives and our communities. Vic Nixon, Jim Argue, Lynn Lindsay, Jimmy Faulkner, Judy Strom, Ken Shamblin, and many more. I invite you to take just a moment to think about and even name out loud if you feel comfortable doing so. Those individuals in your own lives, in your own faith journeys, who have modeled for you what it means to live with sight unseen faith, and to take a moment to thank God for them this morning. Now the writer to the Hebrews is honest with us. There is a lot that threatens to hinder us from living sight unseen faith that we need to throw off. Sin and evil constantly threaten to entangle us and slow us down. So it's something that we have to work at daily. We have to run with perseverance. Living with sight unseen faith requires courage and boldness. The original community that this letter was sent to needed to hear that challenge, and so do we. The fledgling church was in a bit of a spiritual slump. They seemed to be discouraged and growing weary of the Christian life, and for some pretty good reasons. Some of their members had been publicly ridiculed or imprisoned or had their property confiscated, and they were beginning to ask, was it worth it to keep gathering together publicly? Was it worth it to keep following this new way of Jesus when they couldn't even see the direction that way was leading them? If they had been thinking of the country they had left, Hebrews says of Abraham and Sarah, they would have had opportunity to return. If they let themselves think about what was, about the way life had been before God called them to follow, they would have been tempted to turn back. It's a temptation that we all face. It's what turned Lot's wife into salt, what made the rich young ruler walk away sad. And perhaps you too are feeling like you're in a bit of a slump in your faith journey this morning, weary or wary about where following Jesus might lead. Putting our faith in Christ and trusting in God's promises when we can't always see the finish line or the end result is scary, and it is hard. But it is the way of Jesus, and there is no getting away from the fact that it is what's required of us as people of faith who put our trust in God. One of the reasons it was then and is today so important for faith communities to keep meeting together for worship is because it's in worship that we receive Holy Communion, as we will do today. It's at this table that we are reminded of God's love for us, where we receive bread and cup that nourish and strengthen us for the journey and enable us to run with perseverance. It's where we receive the courage and the boldness to live with faith, trusting in God's promises and God's grace. 
It's at this table where we are reminded that the promise of God's love is for us and for all. But the writer does not give us the challenge of living sight unseen faith without also giving us a word of encouragement. Thank goodness. Therefore, our text for today tells us God is not ashamed to be called their God, for God has prepared a city for them. God has gone and is going ahead of us to make a way for us, parting seas or resurrecting the dead if necessary. God is building something beautiful on the foundation of faith that we humbly offer. The word of God is still living and active. The breath of God is still speaking and creating possibility out of impossibility. So even when we can't see it yet, we can trust that it is coming because the one that made that promise to us is faithful. One of the hymns that I sang often growing up is Hymn of Promise. The lyrics sing of the new thing that God is doing, the mysteries of God unfolding before us. The bulb becoming a flower, winter turning into spring, in cocoons a hidden promise, butterflies will soon be free. The hymn reminds us that there is more to life, that there is something new and beautiful coming if we put our trust in the promises of God. To live our lives without that sight unseen faith is to resign ourselves to living as caterpillars when God has created us to be butterflies. In both photography and in mathematics, neither of which are things I claim to be any good at, we find proofs. A mathematical proof is an inferential argument for a statement. Because this statement has been true in every other instance, we can logically conclude that it will be true in every other instance. You can guarantee the proof will work no matter the equation. In photography, proofs are the first round of images you get after a photo shoot. They're not the final product, but they give you a pretty good sense of what the images will look like when the photographer is finished touching them up. I believe that is the kind of evidence that the writer of the Hebrews is talking about when they tell us that faith is the assurance about what we do not see. Because God has been faithful in every other instance, we can infer that God will be faithful to us. It's a proof. We might not be able to see the finished product just yet, but when we look at the original unedited work of the creator, we've got a pretty good sense of what we can expect. It's a proof that God made known to us in Jesus is trustworthy. The good news for us this morning, friends, is that we can trust God with all things in our lives, big and small, because we consider the one faithful who has made the promise. Thanks be to God. Amen.